Welcome to another edition of the As Is Podcast. I am your host, Shabazz. How's everybody feeling today? Hopefully, this podcast finds you in the best mental, physical, and spiritual health. Hopefully, this podcast puts a smile on your face. You know, today it's about positivity. Relax, unwind, and ride with your boy. You know, I always try to come on here and do something a little different. Although the conversation and the subject matter remains the same, but I try to come from different perspectives. I like to relate this story to other stories. So please be mindful when you listen to me that I am doing the best that I know how to uplift you. You know, I don't need you around me if I can't bring something to the table. And understand, bringing something to the table is not always monetary. You know, because you can have a lot of money and still be a lame. You know, you can have a lot of money and still not be happy. You know, it's like being in a house and you feel all alone. And although someone else can be in that house, you may still feel all alone. It's like something is missing. I don't know how to explain it. And the only way to relate is if you've gone through it. So sometimes I try to weave my stories in accordance to that mentality. And I think that is the best mentality for one to understand because it's real. You feel me? This is about being real. This is about looking inside yourself. And sometimes the best way to look inside yourself is to see yourself through others. And a lot of times we don't like to do that because we do not like judgment. You know what I'm saying? We do not like to be judged. But unfortunately, when you put yourself on public display, you are often judged. There will be opinions. There will be things to refute uh, and contest what you say. Now you might ask, why is he saying that? Or some of you may understand exactly what I'm saying. But in any event, let me break down what I mean. And be mindful, in this podcast, I'm really going to go there. You understand? Like, I'm not holding anything back. So let me start off by telling you this. You know, I listen to other podcasts. I read comments. I try to get a feel for what people are saying. Now, one of the podcasts that I heard clips of, uh, I found very intriguing. And I found them to be a lie for Shabazz. Now understand, here's something about the truth that a lot of people don't like. When you tell it, it is a direct uh, reflection of how you feel. And when you tell it, sometimes it can uh, be directly, it, it could be an opposite of what the other person is saying. Therefore, it is interpreted as a lie. You know, uh, that's just what the truth is, yo. So let me start off by saying this. Before I get into this person that I am going to talk about momentarily, I am going to give you some background history starting from 2018. You know, during that time, R. Kelly was going through what R. Kelly was going through. But R. Kelly, you know, not too long from that time was broke. He was broke to a point where he was staying in a hotel off of a highway and the highway uh was a highway, but the hotel, should I say, was not the Four Seasons. You understand? Uh, it wasn't the Mandarin. Uh, it was a highway that was off the, <laughs> off the, it was a hotel that was off the highway, similar to something that a truck driver would stay in. And I am not going to say that, you know, those hotels are above and beyond uh, the average person because sometimes you just want to get some sleep. But in these hotels, in the kind of hotels that I'm talking about, these are placement hotels. And when I say placement, that means sometimes, you know, women have problems and, and they get relocated to wherever or they may be on public assistance and they're awaiting housing. And so this is where the state and the government put you at. You know, uh, that's just what it is. That's not downing anybody. And I have to always give the disclaimer as to why I'm saying it and how I'm saying it, because someone is going to say, oh, Shabazz has targeted me or he's talking about me and he's being condescending. And no, 
That's not what it is. I want you to understand that then on this podcast, we, it is what it is. A spade is a spade, yo. So although you may find yourself or know someone who has been in that situation, don't take it as, you know, as derogatory and directed towards you because we are talking about experiences and things that just happen in life. You understand? So anyway, <clears throat> excuse me, that brother was staying in the hotel like that because he had no money. During this time, R. Kelly was he was as obtainable as uh, getting somebody to help you get items out of your car. Have you ever gone to the supermarket and you seen a guy standing in front of the supermarket and he may have been homeless or he might just be hustling, whatever the case is. And you might say, yo, I got $5 if you help me put this inside my car. You know, a lot of women get those type of services. Men do too. You know, it just depends on how much stuff you have. So, I am going to equate R. Kelly to a person like that at that time. And some of y'all might say, yo, Shabazz, you bugging. You lying. Yo, dog, listen to me. I'm telling you, the man was that low at a time in his life. And I think this is when a lot of the problems started. You know, R. R. Kelly was obtainable to perform for $20,000. We're talking about a man that went from, you know, getting a quarter million dollars a show to now being reduced to $20,000 if you had the entire $20,000. Why am I telling you this? I am telling you this in a direct uh, opposite of the brother Don Russell. Don Russell says he came around in 2018. Don Russell says there was a time in between that 2018 and obviously 2022 that he counted out $400,000 with R. Kelly. That I refute. I do not believe it. And I believe you are lying. And here's why I'll say that to you. During that time, the biggest thing that R. Kelly had going for him was a tour that we were about to sponsor. And sponsor might be the wrong word. Put together. OK, I was an integral part of putting that together uh, person. There was another person who was involved as well, who was a definite intricate part of that. But it wasn't Don Russell. So when, you know, when I'm finding hard, <clears throat> excuse me, about this whole scenario is that there are these people who are stepping up with their stories. And because people have seen them with R. Kelly or they have a good R. Kelly uh, conversation, they believe it. And I'm telling you, them is lies, yo. That man ain't had no $400,000 during that time. Bottom line. You understand? And all that, we were setting up a tour and all that. Let me tell you about the last show that that man had that I filmed, that I was a part of. And I'm going to tell you about his management as well. All right? Uh, during the last show that he performed on a major level was in St. Louis. Now, understand something. What I didn't know at the time and what was told to me later in anger, okay? Uh, this was the information I'm about to divulge was given to me uh, in defense of, of the services that this person performed for R. Kelly. Now, his management prior to uh, the Don Russell area was another guy altogether. And I'm sure if you followed this saga, you know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to mention any names because uh, I don't feel like no phone calls about, yo, why you say this? And, you know, that, you know, I ain't going through all that because I'm not saying it in a way to uh, say something nasty. I'm saying it in a way for you to understand. So anyway, what I didn't know about that show was half of the tickets that were given to the people, you know, half of that arena was filled out with complimentary tickets because the tickets did not sell. I was in that arena and half of that arena was empty. I have the tapes to prove it. So when you sit down and you listen to a Don Russell talk about what he did and how they made this and how they made that. I sit back and look at the tapes. And I also sit back and go into my memory banks and say, yo, you lying. Like, dog, I don't understand why everyone wants to get up in front of this scenario and act like they were this, that and the other when it's not true. And then the insult to injury for me is this. You did all of that and ended up in jail. You understand? Because he's going to jail. Then people are not playing with anybody dealing with the R. Kelly saga. So how important is it for a man to step up and put himself inside the shoes of I am all that I did this and I did that to all to, to end up broke in jail? What you want a war story award? 
because that's all that's equivalent to. And this is what I find bad with our people. You know, we all have stories. But at the end of the day, sometimes you run into people and you'll tell them your story. You know what they tell you, right? Tell your story walking. But people can't accept to tell their story walking and just keeping it to themselves. People now have to convey the God story. And I was God of that situation. And let me tell you why that doesn't make sense. Because it doesn't add up. You understand, you can't add up what you counted four hundred thousand dollars and this happened and that happened. And at the end of the day, you're sitting down with a legal aid lawyer and you're getting ready to go to jail. How much of a God could you have been? Because any God that I know would have done a simple thing and that was planned for the future. Even a drug dealer plans for the future, a smart one, because, you know, sooner or later than people coming to get me. So every time you put some money away, some of that money is designated towards getting a lawyer in the event that you have to defend yourself from your criminal activities. Now, on the level of an R. Kelly with accountants and CPAs and lawyers and agents and this, you don't think that there was a planning for that? Because based on Don Russell, uh, you have poor planning and your planning is even poorer than that, because at the end of the day, you sitting on YouTube on somebody's platform and that that word ain't going to spread. And I am not going. And I, you know what? Let me just say this for the, for the record. I am talking about Texas Black Diamond, her platform. I have nothing against Texas Black Diamond. I am not trying to say anything bad about Texas Black Diamond, but I want you all to understand what I'm saying. And I want you to apply it to Shabazz as well. You understand? We are, dog, listen, we all in the same building. You understand? So it's like I've always said, you can't call a crackhead a crackhead if the crackhead is your neighbor. So I am not saying it to be derogatory or facetious towards Texas Black Diamond. But at the end of the day, you have to understand. Let me give you an analogy. It's like seeing a. Uh, I tell you one, and and I don't really know this brother. I had an assistant though who who claimed that he slept on her couch. Uh, but I'm gonna give you a, a, a up. I'm gonna give you a quick analogy of uh, Flavor Flav, right? I seen Flavor Flav on a lawyer's commercial, okay? And it's for car accidents if you get hurt and this, this, that, and the other. And I said to myself, for Flavor Flav, that is a downgrade. We, we talking about one of the pioneers who started reality TV. We talking about, uh, in no disrespect, but we talking about, you know, it depends on, you know, everybody likes what they like. You know what I'm saying? So before I say this, let me just be mindful of that. But in my opinion, we talking about one of the ugliest dudes on TV who had 30 women throwing themselves at him. So there was a time when he was on top of the mountain. Right. But now he's subjected himself and his popularity has gone down to being on a, uh, a lawyer's car crash commercial. Now, understand for Flavor Flav, that is downward for the lawyer. It's upward. You understand? It's like seeing like one day. Let me give you an example. You see, you know, you know who you know who Dr. Dre is today. Right. And then tomorrow you see Dr. Dre on a, a commercial that he's pitching to borrow money. It doesn't match. That's Dr. Dre. We all know he was at one time a billionaire. We all know that at one time he was on top. But now all of a sudden he's pitching borrowing money. For the person or the commercial, the people that are behind it, the company, that is an upgrade for them. But for Dr. Dre, it is a downward. So Don Russell, and I say this to say, and this is nothing against Texas Black Diamond. I know my words are going to be interpreted to be nasty. I am going to say it again. This is no disrespect to Texas Black Diamond. But Don Russell, if you was what you said you was, if you if you are who you think you are in your head, you wouldn't be on Texas Black Diamond's platform because it ain't going nowhere. <laughs> There's just the truth. You understand? And let me let me let me criticize myself. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, I did the documentary. It didn't go nowhere. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm not saying it again, you know, uh, and I don't even want to keep trying to defend it. But the point that I'm trying to make is, you know, God's, you know, they don't uh, they don't mess with smaller people. You understand? Like, that's just what it is. So. 
that right there within itself told me, yo, dog, you ain't you ain't who you claim to be. Now, if you want to live like that and people have the right to live like that, that's fine, yo. You know what I'm saying? But what makes it unfine and not fine is when you put it out on a public platform, because what you do is you allow people to come in and criticize or critique. Once you go public, you have to be able and waiting for anyone to say whatever they choose to say. It's just as simple as that. You know what I mean? So the $400,000 counting, how, where, where did you do that at? Because he didn't have $400,000. And I'll tell you another thing. The person who was in charge of R. Kelly's money and collecting it was my man, like a family member. It was not you. The person who was in charge 20 years ago of collecting the money for the after clubs and the app for the after parties for the Jay-Z Best of Both World Tours was that same person. And it wasn't you. You weren't even around back then. Now, you might think that I have a personal attack against Don Russell, and I don't. I am just tired of seeing these people pop out of nowhere with these stories, and they are straight, bold-faced lies. And then the insult to injury is these guys and these people who are coming up with all of these stories are ending up in jail. So how credible do you think these people actually are? And I'm not taking a shot at nobody because they down. I understand that, but I'm just keeping it real. A, a spade is a spade, right? So check it. Dabowski is, you know, one of the flag holders for the R. Kelly, free R. Kelly. But he took it so far that he going to end his behind up in jail. Don Russell, same thing. All of these people have these award winning stories or award winning voices, right? Award winning fights and they are award winning in jail. How you going to believe them? Yo, R. Kelly was a magnificent performer at one time. He probably still is. But in his personal life, that was not the situation at all. And every time I get on the podcast, my phone starts to ring. Let me cut him off. So back to what I was saying. The reason why I'm even saying is because I happen to see that clip. Then, you know, not too long ago, someone else uh, Instagrams me a DM and to a, a group, and I'll tell you who the group was. Uh, it was OCOV. I don't say anything, you know. I, I try to stay away, you know. And, and let me just say this as well. I don't got nothing against OCOV. I like some of them. You know what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, I don't have a problem with any of them, again. And I don't even want to dredge this up. But my only problem, personally, was with Larry. I don't have a problem with someone having a different opinion as me. If you have a different opinion, that's fine. Because understand, when I came in this game, I told you I was going to play both sides. And the reason why is because that is the only way to fairly tell a story. You have to tell both sides. So I understand there's going to be resistance towards Shabazz from both sides. But as I listen to a speaker, uh, and I'll tell you the speaker, uh, Cash Jones. <laughs> <sighs> Like, I don't want to attack people, and I'm not. You know, I don't want to attack Cash Jones. But uh, Cash Jones, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> there are some things that I could say, but I'm not even, you know, this is not about being negative. But I am just finding a lot of these stories uh, conflicting to what would actually happen. I'm, you know, I'm seeing people, you know, throw a stone and hide their hand. You understand? All of these people were involved one way or another, but are their stories accurate? You know, if you were inside, you know, they're not. If you're on the outside, they create a doubt. You understand? They create uh, they create something to make you want to believe them. I just don't believe them. I'm not going to say who I don't believe and who I do believe and which part is what. And the reason why I'm saying that about Don Russell is because, yo, you know, as, as brilliant as you think you are and as much as you think you've done, R. Kelly was messed up, yo. Like, I know that for a fact. You understand? Even with Azriel saying that, you know, they were, she was going to the stores because he didn't have no money and he was searching for money in his pockets. But that's your error. How was your era a time when the man was running in storage, searching his pockets, couldn't pay his bills, 
but you did this and you did that. You were this and you were that. It's too many you were this and you were that. You understand? <laughs> and that man's still locked up. So it doesn't matter if he's guilty or innocent. What matters is how did he get into that condition? And where, where are all of these heroes, true, real stories in regards to it? Because those ain't the real stories, yo. And you know what my proof is? Before anybody jumps the gun and says this, you know, Shabazz, you a hater and this, this, that, and other. Riddle me this. How come he in jail? Like all of these heroes, all of these fantastic stories. How come the man is in jail? How come he couldn't even bail himself out? Why? How come he's gone through? This is the second uh, case with a whole different set of lawyers. And how come with every lawyer that was either signing over his life's rights, signing over, you know, whatever he had to sign over because he didn't have any money? How come he couldn't acquire Tom Mesero? How come he couldn't help himself to the point where he would have had a better chance of being home right now based on what all of these spectacular people have done? That is a bunch of garbage. Anybody that wants to, you know, debate Shabazz, yo, you know, I'm, I'm open for it. But I can tell you this and I warn you in advance. Hear me. I come with facts, yo. I don't get involved in, in nothing unless I can prove it. You understand? And I've been doing this for a long time, way before 2018. You understand? And I am not basing who I am on another man. To me, that's the lowest of the low. It's like, you know, you, you know of somebody and every time you turn around, they talking about, yo, my man got this. My man just bought a Lambo. My man just went to Spain. My man, man I don't want to hear about your man. What about you? What have you done? You understand? And you know what? Don't be on your way to jail telling me about what you've done because now I don't believe it. Don't be sitting up there having a defense attorney that's a legal aid because now I really don't believe it because it says it speaks volumes. And y'all got to look at those pictures. Let me move away from that now and get into some real, you know, investigative for Shabazz's mentality work. You understand? Again, I am not being condescending. I am not trying to throw anybody under the bus. But, yo, I'm going to tell you what it is. You understand? It's just like, you know, me telling you my story right now or telling you the story from what my part of the involvement of R. Kelly versus Jennifer Bonjean. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jennifer Bonjean can come in and probably tell me things that I have no clue about and shut me down based on her investigation and her being a lawyer. I can't get mad at her and say, oh, you're trying to be condescending. Oh, you're a hater. No, I can't say that because her level of investigation is different. She has an inside insight of what's going on. So everybody's levels is different. Yo, what's important is y'all knowing the truth. You know, I'm sure there are going to be books that are going to come out during this saga and after this saga. I am sure there are going to be a million stories. But, yo, I'm telling you, you better. I don't know. Yo, you know, I, I'm not interested in writing a book. You understand? Like, if I was interested in writing a book, I would have wrote a book just based on entertainment way before R. Kelly. Because some of the things that I've seen, you know, y'all just wouldn't believe. I've seen some behavior that has been just... <laughs> Yo, but, I, you know, sometimes you be on the kiss and don't tell. You know what I'm saying? Like when you sworn to a code and you up, up you, when you're sworn to a code and you uphold that code, uplift uh, that mentality uh, for betterment, there's some things you just don't do. You understand? So me sitting down and pinning a tell all. Nah, son, I ain't even doing all that. But I am not going to just sit idly by and listen to a bunch of lies. You understand? So now, again, let me move away from that. What I told you guys in my last podcast was I was trying to be uh, as investigative as humanly possible. And I am not uh, I am not a professional. You know, I'm just a nigga from the street, like I said before. But I just wanted to do my due diligence towards this whole scenario or any job that I get involved in. You know, I'm like that in my relationships. Like, if I love you, I love you. I'm going all out with you. And I expect the same thing from you. 
If I get involved with a job, I'm coming to work and I'm going to go all out with my work and I expect my boss to pay me. <laughs> and maybe that's a bad analogy because I don't work for nobody. <laughs> I just that's just and the reason why is because my attitude is too bad. It's not because I'm better than nobody, but I just ain't having nobody tell me what to do. It's just not happening, period. I've always been like that. You understand? Some people, you know, I can work well with others when uh, I'm the boss. <laughs> and that might be bad, but I can't work well with others when you tell me what to do. Because I, I just, I, I don't, that's just not what's going to happen. So anyway, what I'm saying is, you know, I gave you a black psychologist, the top of her field. Today, I bring you another. And one of the things, you know, I'm proud of, especially with, you know, the black psychologists, as well as with the white psychologists, is this. Our conversations got deep. You know, the more you let a person talk in a conversation, the deeper and closer to the core of that person you get. So one of the things that we discussed, you know, based on the clip that I'm going to show you is uh, the young girls and, and what prompted them to uh, want to mess with R. Kelly. Now, I am not going to say they were underage just for the sake of argument. You understand? And be mindful, you know, the people that are listening, R. Kelly is convicted, bottom line. You know what I'm saying? So you could say, you know, I'm throwing hate and I'm not doing none of that. If, if we are going to be real and honest, let's just be real and honest. But I am still going to refrain from saying, you know, these girls were 15, 14. Yo, I didn't say that at all. But if that is the case and that's what he's convicted of, then that's what it is. That is another thing that I do not like about this, you know, because although I believe that there are things that happened in that case and in his life that were wrong, you still got to tell the truth. And my truth in my heart, you know, in my heart of hearts, I feel that R. Kelly uh, played a mouse, a mite. R. Kelly played a mouse and cat game and the girls played one, too. I think everybody involved uh, should be responsible for what happened. And I don't believe that he should be alone. You understand? R. Kelly was R. Kelly and R. Kelly knew that. Them girls knew who they were dealing with when, when they did what they did. So they tried to find ways to counter. You understand? And it was, you know, who was going to get to who first? Unfortunately, R. Kelly always came out on top. And the reason why he always came out on top is because he was R. Kelly. You understand? So that was kind of the mentality that I had when I was asking the psychiatrist this, these questions. But she goes on to break it down and she breaks it down, down. You understand? You got to see her. And I'm going to show you the clip. So uh, before I even show you that clip, I'm going to tell you the succession of how we're going to do it. I'm going to go from her and then I'm going to go to Daryl because I am going to explain how a con man was able to infiltrate that camp and be a con. And how does someone on the level of R. Kelly allow the con to happen? You understand? And I think that that was definitely pre-planned. And I think that that came from not just, uh, I'm going to say it. I think Greenberg has something to do with that. I think the mentality of it. But I'm going to explain that to you. Let me shut up right now and take a look and listen to what this lady is saying. I think that this is like a, a very deep, like when you unpack the question of um, who do you blame if a 16 year old is willingly going over to a 40 year old man's house to sleep there, who, who do you blame if she's the one who seems to be going willingly? And that is a story that is indicative of a much larger problem of uh, institutionalized violence that starts even at preschool to education that basically lots of neighborhoods are starved of real opportunity except for mass incarceration so when you have people that are in poverty what looks like a choice is really not a choice and if you had all things being equal the same resources there ain't gonna be a bunch of 16 year old girls running to go sleep with some creepy guy who's like older and has kids older than her and all that that's not something that people choose when they have resources and when they have agency and when they have education and when they know where they're going 
So what you're saying is, is actually it's deeper than the poverty, but it, it starts from education. Well, I think that those two things go hand in hand. And that, you know, I, I don't know if this is a, too far afield for this particular conversation, but the way that we fund education is through a tax base. And if the taxes that the people pay on their houses is how much you have in order to educate the children, if there's not a lot of taxes being collected in one neighborhood, guess what the education's going to be like? And then you go like, you know, 10 miles away where there's a bunch of rich people living and they have plenty of money for fantastic education. I mean, in the city of Chicago, we spend about $5,000 per student. If you go right outside the city limits to Evanston, it's more than $20,000 per student. Who do you think is going to be ready for college? Who do you think is going to see more on their horizon? So do you think any of this happens to deal with race? Do you think that's the undertone of it? Or is it, is it race? Or is it finance? Or is it a little bit of both? Racism is baked into all kinds of policy and legislation, and it has been for hundreds of years in this country. And one of the things that is an, uh, um, that I think is a byproduct of our economic system, of capitalism, is that there's a lot of money to be made off of a permanent underclass. And so uh, people that were enslaved were a permanent underclass. People that were kept down by Jim Crow or people that were pushed onto reservations or people that could not immigrate or get a legal status, they create this underclass who has to pay more for less across the board for housing, for food, for education, for health care, for like every single system. It's baked into, racism is baked into how we run every system in this country. Let me push the question a little further. Do you believe racism has anything to do with actually convicting or accusing R. Kelly? I think that R. Kelly was able to get away for a long period of time with behavior that was pushed aside because he was famous and he was selling dreams. And I think his fame, this isn't the, the average uh, pedophile story because you have somebody who has so much more power due to their fame and because of the perceived ability for them to open doors for people. And so I think that you need to see a greater power differential in this particular case when you're dealing with, you know, R. Kelly as a celebrity. There's also like sports heroes or entertainment people who um, don't understand or who abuse their power as famous or wealthy people, powerful people, because they can. And I think that um, R. Kelly's fame was a big driver. If you're asking, do I think that he is being sought after because of race? Uh, I think if it were just about that, he would have been sought after like mm, two decades ago when a lot of this stuff first came out if people were that hungry for him. But I think that there's a lot of layers of things. There's sexism. There's racism, there's classism, there's all these things. And so people can quickly say, oh, you're trying to keep him down. Well, you know, R. Kelly, I mean, it's a, you're try, I just feel like the question is really like simplifying something that's like has a lot of layers, right? I do think black people are far more criminalized than white people in this country. That's as plain as the nose on my face. I mean, that's the truth. Every statistic backs that up. I think it's unfair to ask if it's because of race that R. Kelly's finally getting busted because it's actually because of his fame that he's been protected for as long as he has been. So let me ask you. Now, be mindful. She's a psychiatrist. Uh -oh. She's in the top of her field. So her answers are based on education. Her answers are based on uh, experience. And I can tell you she was definitely uh, 
anti R. Kelly. And I didn't have a problem with that. And the reason why is because I came into this to be non-biased. You understand? I came into this to show both sides. So I wanted it to be well balanced. You know, my hat's off to her. And the reason why my hat's off to her is because, you know, she she just said what it was and she has statistics and facts to back it up. You know, her opinion may have been what some don't agree with. However, she had something to support it. And anybody that has something to support what they say, I am in full compliance with. You know, so she is to be commended. For me, you know, race was very important when trying to prove this point simply because I wanted the perspective of white America and black America on one man. It's no different than, you know, let me give you an example. You know, you have a, a young man who's accused of rape. You know, he committed a rape in, let's, let's not even say black and white, he committed a rape in a Spanish part of town. But this person is black. So what better thing than, than to have a Spanish attorney represent him in a Spanish community? That is the best way he is going to get somewhat of equal and fair justice you understand like going in another way it doesn't look good so coming into the fight and trying to show you guys something i had to come that way you understand but let's move away from that what i want to get into now is uh we get ready to go into daryl uh daryl was r kelly's spokesperson and let me just let you be mindful of this from the gate when i first seen him i felt like there was something wrong now you know, you're not supposed to be judgmental, but we're people. We can't help but to be judgmental. And my judging uh, didn't override my personal feelings. You understand? Because I felt like he was a switch hitter from the day that I seen him. And I wondered to myself, how did he get involved with the R. Kelly case? And then I found out later that uh, Steve Greenberg selected him. Now, let me just give you some background on why I'm going to say what I'm going to say. You know, Steve Greenberg has to be a counselor. He has to be a therapist. He has to be a psychologist, as does any lawyer. But the punchline to all of that is they also have to be liars. They have to be convincing enough to sway a jury of 12 people to agree and believe what they believe. So for them, human behavior and studying people is something that they must be able to do. They have to be able to pick a person or pick an argument in a fight that they can convey to those people to understand. You understand? So what I'm trying to say is I think that he selected what he believed was the perfect person to represent R. Kelly. Now, you know, you might say, oh, well, Shabazz, you, you know, you being whatever, uh, you know, because you just said that dude is a switch hitter. Well, switch hitting was a part of the R. Kelly case. Like, you know, some of y'all are going to get mad because I said it, but it is what it is. It was a part of the case. So what better way than to have a switch hitter sit up and represent you? Now, you know, I'm not going to say it took something away or it gave it something for me. You understand? But I'm going to tell you something about switch hitters and, you know, that whole mentality. They take away or it's believed to take away the confrontational aspect of anything. And here's why I'll say this, you know, when you have, you know, a gay person in a hotel and I'm going to use something that I'm accustomed to, something that I've experienced personally. When you go stay in hotels, you know, finer hotels, uh, a lot of times if you don't see a female behind that desk, you see a gay guy. And the reason why is because they're not argumentative or they're not supposed to be. You know, it depends on which level of gay we're talking about. If we're talking about gay from the hood, you might get cussed out, <laughs> you know, because they got a mouth that it just make you go bananas. But if you're talking about, you know, an, uh, an upscale, educated, you know, gay person, they're non-confrontational. So their answers and their movements are going to be subservient to the customer. You understand? So from that perspective, when you think about who you should select, as a spokesperson, you want that quality in them. Now, understand, I'm just a nigga from the streets, but I understand that mentality. You understand? So somebody like a Steve Greenberg, he there's no comparison because he's far more advanced to me, advanced than me as far as the law and law intellect. Dig what I'm saying to you. Like 
There is a difference. And although I feel I can sit down and talk to anybody about any conversation and topic, there are going to be topics that's override and what they're saying goes over my head. It doesn't mean they're smarter than me. It just means they were able to go over my head because they dug deeper with the intellect, with the thought process. It's the same as whether you guys know it or not. When you go to a job, you know, some of those people are, are behavioral specialists. They can tell by the questions and the answers that you give whether you are going to be a good fit or not. You may believe that you put down all of the right answers, but there is a question during that interview that they are going to ask you to throw you off. And depending on that answer is going to depend on whether or not you get the job because your feelings towards one thing may not align and go with what they're saying as far as the job is concerned. And because of that, you could be qualified, you know, educationally, you could be qualified because you have the right diction and the right way to speak. But that one question just said to, you know, the, to the person trying to hire you, you're not going to fit with this company, you know? So I think that those are characteristics, qualities and traits that a lawyer has to have in order to be successful. You understand? So they know who to pull in and who to have as a player. This is why Daryl, I believe, came in. And I also believe that there had to be some insight to see that Daryl was a con man. You feel me? Like the first time I seen him, I seen him on TV. And like I said, my spider sense is immediately, you know, tingled. But I see things sometimes different because I look at it from a different angle. And when I thought about it, I said, well, he is the perfect spokesperson for that because he represents one part of a community that takes pride in being able to handle these type of confrontational situations because they're going to counter by being non-confrontational. But as great as that quality is, there's a dark side to it. And the dark side to it was he was a spectacular, phenomenal liar. Now, I'm going to tell you why I say he's a liar. Again, the first time I seen him was on TV. But then I met him. I immediately seen game in him from the door. You know, I, I he took away. Let me tell you something. He took away the switch hitter thought to that of a pimp. Because he had that pimp game and the Mac game down to a science. But he didn't do it with the way, you know, you would see Iceberg Slim. Nah, his pimp was a whole lot more advanced because he had a lot of game. And he had the conversation to back it up. And what backed that up was the fact that America had given him a platform to make you believe him simply because he was on TV and he was representing R. Kelly. So you think about that psyche. The psyche behind that is I've seen him on the news. He's representing R. Kelly. So what he's saying has to be official. I can believe that he is messing with the president of, a, of the United States simply because you've seen him on Channel 7. You understand? There's a psyche to that, y'all. Feel what I'm saying to you. It's no different than when you see. I, I think there's a psyche to it. And sometimes that psyche is derogatory. You want me to tell you why? I'll tell you why. You ever see on the news sometimes? something happening and the newscasters always seeming to find the most embarrassing black person that there is in the crowd to explain what happened. And you like of all the people that they had to ask, why would they ask this person? Or have you ever noticed that sometimes on the news, depending on the incident, there was a tragedy that happened in Illinois. And I've noticed all of the news anchors that they've sent to cover the Highland Park travesty has been black. I mean, they, they've I'm sorry, definitely not black. They've all been white or of Latin descent. You know, unfortunately, those people lost their lives sitting down for the 4th of July and of course of the mad shooter that shot them all up. But they ain't sent nobody black to cover that. Not locally. On the national level, yes, you may see a Don Lemon or you may see a Alex Rodriguez. But on a local level, they send what people will accept. You understand? Because the psyche behind that is a black person can't deliver this story the same way someone uh, of the same color can because now they can relate. And they want you to relate to see that is, it is horrific. There's a psychology behind all of that. And although you guys may not see it that way, I'm trying to tell you, yo, it is. 
That psychology and that psyche also applies to the R. Kelly situation because it's done for a reason. And what happens is those reasons, as simple as they are, go over most people's heads. But those reasons are the differences between guilty and not guilty. So now let me now that I've explained that, hopefully you understand. Now, after seeing him on TV and first talking to him, I, too, fell victim for it. I'm going to keep it 100. And I'm going to go into it real deep and tell you why and how I, I fell for it. You know, you know what? Sometimes a person can come through and if you believe something, you start to believe the lies in the webs that they weave. You understand? So now, the first lie and web that was weaved by Daryl with me was not just R. Kelly, but what we could do as a result of R. Kelly. Here's what he had to back him up psychologically. He had gotten R. Kelly on Gail King. We all know Gail King is a part of Oprah Winfrey. Now, be mindful. Let me give you this, this disclaimer. Everything I'm about to say has not been, you know, substantiated from Gail King or Oprah Winfrey. So I do not want to include them and say something that they, you know, uh, said. It. I don't want the, I don't want it to appear as if what I'm saying uh, they actually did. I am telling you the mentality behind it. So do not twist my words. But because I know he's R. Kelly's spokesperson, because I know of Gail King, I would call him credible. Now, I'm in entertainment. You know, one of the ways that he captured my attention was, you know, Shabazz, yo, you know, I got some people behind me and I want to create a TV show. You know, and the people that are behind me uh, do big things. Now, he always implied Gail and because it was Gail, her friend being Oprah. So it was believable. You understand? He had something to back him up. Although he misrepresented what it was, nevertheless, he was allowed that platform to go around and be a con man. Now, let me tell you why I fell for the con. The reason why I fell for the con is because I'm in this business and I know how hard it is to break in. Let me tell you something, y'all. Yo, trying to get a TV show trying to get a documentary, trying to get a movie is not as simple as just going and filming and putting it out. Not at all. Like there are so many politics that it is just bananas because if it was that simple, everybody would do it and everybody can't do it. So what happens is when you are in this business, you are always looking for that contact who can take it to the next level simply by walking it in. Who better than to believe Little old Shabazz that comes from the hood can create a project that can be walked in front of Gail or Oprah Winfrey. Now, this is always what was actually dangled in front of my head to keep my attention. You understand? So I would be more inclined to go for the nonsense, for the lies. And this is how he was able to con the other people that he is alleged to have conned. Now, if you're not in this business, you might be able to see immediately that he was full of shit. But if you're in this business and because you know how this business goes, there's always a side of you that says, give him a chance. You may feel like he's lying, but still give him a chance. And the reason why is because you just don't know and you are always looking for that break. Do not believe because a person is this or a person is that, that they automatically have the power and the juice to get to the next level because every level and every step that you take requires you starting all over again to prove and produce on the level you're trying to get into. Now, what that means is we dominated the streets. My magazine dominated the streets and I will challenge anybody. And it was only three in our genre. And, you know, even though I'm going to say what it was, it was Dawn Diva, Feds and As Is, period. That was the streets. I dominated the DVD game. I have 16 independent documentaries on the biggest names for drug dealers and gang bangers in the history of America. But that's on the streets. TV is a whole nother ball game. Getting in is a whole nother ball game. They play a different level. And this is why I say, you know, you can't take streets and make it corporate because there are different rules. It just doesn't work. So with that being said, because you know all of that, you now have somebody who you know is a direct connect to those type of people. So what you do is you allow yourself to come in and be conned. You dig? So this is what he did. 
So he tells me, yo, Baz, listen, you know, I'm getting ready to put this show together and I want you to produce it. Now, be mindful. You know, I may talk and say what I say and some may feel that I'm conceited or some may feel that I'm, you know, condescending. But in my heart of hearts, yo, I'm just going to keep it 100. I know I'm just a nigga from the street. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just keep it 100. I'm still a regular nigga from the streets and I'm still, you know, fighting to make it just like everybody else. I was never satisfied with whatever level that I was on because I always knew and know that there's a higher level. And although you might think, you know, that I think that I'm all of that, but that's because your expectation of success is different than mine. See, people become intimidated with things because they never look outside of their actual truth. Meaning if we all are in the ghetto and I'm doing ghetto things, be it whatever it is for that level, I may intimidate you because you're only looking from a level that you know about. And that is ghetto. You understand? But as me doing what I'm doing, I am not looking for the ghetto level. In the beginning, you start and you do what you do based on where you're from and where you're at. But as you grow and expand, you see that there's a higher step. And that is what you start to project. That is what you start to go after. It's called growth. A lot of us don't have that growth because some of us are happy with the success level that we are on. But I've always wanted more because I know there's more. You understand? This is how con men are able to come in because they're brilliant as well because they know their subject matter. And the same feelings that I have, they've experienced. So they know how to make it relatable. They know how to keep you know, the meat in front of your face like you would do a dog. You want the dog to run, tie a rope around his neck, put some meat on a stick and put it right in front of him. He's going to chase something that he is a part of all day, never knowing that I'll never catch that. Because every step that I take towards going, I'm taking the meat with me. And they never figure out, just stop, bow your head, shake your body and the meat will come off. You understand? Yo, it's kind of deep. And if you just think about situations, you'll understand. So, again, when he t offered me a chance for production, I was all with it. Because he says, yo, on my first show, I am going to, you know, get Drake. I'm going to get Jay-Z. You know, I'm, uh, I'm going to get XYZ. So now, understand, I've been around Jay-Z. I did the, you know... Best of Both Worlds tour with him and R. Kelly. You know, I, I, I don't remember if I told you all the story about it, and I, and I ain't going to go into that. But the point is, I know that level, you dig? Like, I know that Jay-Z, Drake level is just another level. That is a level to where you go from, you know, you're making a dollar for shooting rappers' videos to being on their level, and now you're making a hundred grand for shooting a three-and-a-half-minute video. You know, now, you know, you rubbing elbows with Barack Obama. You understand? It's just a whole entire different level. Now, as a filmmaker or being in entertainment, who doesn't want to go to that level? So there's, you know, it's like, it's like that is the end goal. Like if you are going, yo, listen, if you're going to get in it, get in it to win, yo. You know what I'm saying? You don't get in it to, to, to end up with a little boozy. And I'm not dissing Little Boozy, but I know, yo, there's such more bigger mark than Little Boozy that it ain't funny. You understand? Some people are happy with ending up being just with Little Boozy, and that's where their career stops. Nah, dog. Like, if you want to be great, you got to think great, and you got to know that there is always bigger, and you always want to be a part of that. And if someone you believe has the potential to offer you that, you buy into what? A con. So when it was happening, I didn't realize it. You understand? Like the brother told me, yo, you know, I, w I was with him on several occasions. I was with him when, you know, Gail, this is I know, and, you know, whatever network, good morning, it was a good morning, America, whatever network Gail works for, they sent for him to do an interview on television, you know, and they put him in a hotel, a plush hotel. I stayed in that hotel. You know what I mean? I know that they footed the bill. So what he was saying made it believable. You understand? Because he had something to back it up. But here's my point. He was nothing but a con. You understand? 
because the reality of it should have said to me, Shabazz, yo, do you really believe this dude? Don't listen to this nigga. Like, get out of here with that crap. But I didn't do it. You understand? And this is how he was able to do what he did. This is how it is also alleged that there was a $200,000 payment coming from Gail, who was backed by Oprah or backed by her network in order to get R. Kelly to even do that interview because R. Kelly didn't want to do the interview. You understand? But what made him want to do the interview was money. You know, him busting out crying and having a theatric that he did, that wasn't free, y'all. There was a hidden agenda behind that. And it was a hidden agenda because he knew the cases that he was fighting. He knew that he didn't have any money. And this was an opportunity to get on national TV, sell and tell his story and get paid for it. Somewhere along that line, that money came up missing. Somewhere along that line, the money wasn't there. Somewhere along that line, it was denied or has never really been addressed by Oprah or Gail. And I use Oprah simply because we know or what appears to be or what we you know, think it is. Gail King's power came as a result of friendship with Oprah Winfrey. Would Gail King have been would Gail King have been as successful as she is without the backing of Oprah? I don't think so. And let me take you something even deeper. Would Oprah have been as successful as Oprah is without a Weinstein? I don't think so. And guess where Weinstein is at? Weinstein is worse. Uh, <laughs> he worse off than R. Kelly because he got the same type of crimes. Ain't nobody really paying attention to that. They are, but they aren't. But you know what? It just shows you, you know, the movements of Hollywood and how you get from one step to another step. And this is just my opinion because Gail King and Oprah Winfrey both are talented people, but you need somebody to co-sign you. You need somebody to vouch behind you. You need somebody to step up and say, hey, wait, take a look. This is yada, 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 yada. And for Oprah, it just happened to be a Weinstein who is one of the most, <laughs> you already know his history, so I don't have to, I don't have to say it. So, I say all of that to say this is what was a part of the R. Kelly camp from the door. People like Daryl and the other one, Daryl McDavid. And I'm going to tell him, tell his story in my next podcast. But does that take away his guilt or does that make, you know, him now innocent? No, I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is there was a circle of snakes, liars and thieves his entire career. And they all played on the fact that, you know, uh, it was alleged that he can't read. But now I'm going to hit you with something else. You know, the obvious to me is I don't believe that he can't read crap. You want me to tell you why I don't? Because in court, it was proven that the mother was sending texts. Azriel Clary's mother was sending R. Kelly texts and telling him what to, her what to say to R. Kelly. And she had texted him. That's what is alleged. How did he read it? How did he text back? If he can't read. So that right there, I dispute that. There might be a level to what he could do. He might have had a fourth grade reading level, but he could read, yo. Y'all believe that if you want to. See, and the reason why I say this is because every part of this case, there is something that can counter it just based on the evidence. Now, those who are for R. Kelly, y'all ain't going to acknowledge that. Those who are against, now you have a point up. But the truth is the truth. And in order to tell the story, you have to tell the entire story outside of myself. And I'm not bigging myself up, but outside of myself, I don't see not one person telling the whole real story. Not one. Everybody has a part of the story that is beneficial to their story to make them look bigger. You know, nobody wants to take the heat. You understand? So you're going to have those who are going to side on this side. And they're not going to say the truth or acknowledge the truth or admit the truth because they don't want to be opposed by the other side. And then the other side is not going to say this because they don't want to be accused of being anti R. Kelly. So when are we going to get the true real story? Because most of the story is already done. He's in jail. But you know what's going to be interesting? That if someone actually does write a book or if someone does do a movie, what they should do is do the underbelly and, and, and show how it came to what it came to. Because this is how we prevent it from happening again. 
You understand? In America, we know guilt or innocence, but do we ever ask ourselves why? Do we ever attack the actual problem to prevent it? No, we don't do that. We just throw away the key and say guilty. Or we, you know, open up the door and let them out. But nobody goes after the core of the cause. You understand? And be mindful, again, I'm just a little old nigga from the streets. And I see that through experience, with age, with time, with dealing with people, and being able to admit my faults. And one of my faults was, secretly, I wanted it deep enough and bad enough to be conned by Daryl with his promises of producing a show. I don't have a problem with admitting that. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if somebody runs, if Russell Simmons runs in front of you right now, and although he may not be who he used to be and promises you a record deal, you might buy into that simply because you know the history of who? Russell Simmons. Now, although the industry might have, you know, ostracized him and he might be going through whatever it is, it's not going to take away the fact that he's Russell Simmons. You understand? Like you can't take away the fact that Mike Tyson is Mike Tyson, even though he lost. There was a time where everybody knows he would knock you from north to west. And that's what we've bought into. And this is how people are allowed to get into organizations and become conned. And the reason why is there is no one to sit inside of that organ organization and think objectively. And even if you have the power to think objectively, the reason why they don't allow it is because they're going to say, Shabash, shut up. You from the hood. How you know all of that? They're never going to take you serious because according to statistics and school and whatever, you're not qualified to tell it. But at the end of the day, and this is what I stress to my people, you are. This is why I always say never let nobody tell you that you can't do this or you can't do that because you don't have something in front of your name or you don't have the experience that they think is experience. You can't say I am not going to say this and I'm going to keep my mouth shut because they are not smarter than us. They're just not. And once we learn that, we'll be better off. And once we also learn that, Daryl wouldn't be able to exist because Daryl has conned many a people. He's on, he, he's got cases right now. Take a look at him and you decide if what I'm saying is true. Okay, well, first question I want to ask you is define and explain exactly what you meant on the Gail King interview. Well, I think uh, it was misinterpreted, number one. Uh, I think it was blown out of proportion. Um, I mis met Ms. Kelly eight months ago, and I arrived from Towers Unannounced. Uh, Mr. Kelly, um, it seemed that he had just woken up, and then he had went into, um, I guess, the studio. He had been in the studio, I guess, doing some songs or something, I'm not really sure. He came out, we talked, Mr. Greenberg, Stephen Greenberg was with me. We went and we had a good conversation. He was a very um, interesting, quiet, humble person. And we talked and uh, you know, we moved forward with uh, me being his crisis manager. Uh, from that point, we pretty much met every day. At some point, we were um, either at Trump Towers or you know, you know, at his apartment. I was one of the few people that had access to him. And you know, a lot of times I went without Mr. Greenberg. You know, we would meet in the evening time. He was like, well, let's meet here. We'd meet and we would talk. and. I would give him different scenarios on the approach and what needed to happen, you know, different things. I'm not an attorney, but what the motion looked like, what to expect, what would be coming. You know, we talked about the Man Act. Early on, I advised Ms. Kelly that um, he would probably be charged more than likely 99% uh, with the Man Act. I told him about um, Chuck Berry. You know, he took a 14-year-old girl across state lines, and he, he spent three years in the state penitentiary. I explained that to Ms. Kelly. I also told him about... Uh, I got to interrupt you. That is a great observation. What do you think the differences is in today's world with the people that are charged with that kind of stuff? Do you think it sets a precedence between black and white? Is there some type of a race issue that underlines all of this? Because there are other entertainers who have been charged or who have been accused of this and has been swept under the rug. Why is it such a targeted attack on Kelly? I would say this. I, you look at, uh, we can go back. Uh, we can go back beyond Michael Jackson. Let's use Michael Jackson. Whitney Houston. 
Prince, Bill Cosby, James Brown, we're finding out possibly he, had, he was murdered. All of these people, if you combine them together, R. Kelly has the greatest archives of music ever combined. He is a cash cow. And so uh, without Kelly, with Kelly out of the way, you have um, who, who owned the royalties? Who's going to be in charge of that? You know, that's what you got to look at. And I just believe that um, the greater thing is um, Michael Jackson had the Beatles and Elvis Presley. Look what happened after he died. They said Prince owned all of his rights. His his state was broken up to six different ways. So when you look, Whitney Houston died broke. Tyler Perry paid for her funeral, flew her body, paid for the entire thing. If you look at these people in the in the in the organizations that are backing them, it's almost like when they're done with them in their fifties, they throw them away. Whitney in her fifties, Michael in his fifties, Prince in his fifties. So do you think it's a coincidence that they all happen to be African American? No, I don't think so. I I think um, this has been going on for a long time. I think um, uh, it's systemic. It's been going on, you know, for the last 40, 50, 60 years. Um, so you would say or you would agree that race is a part of everything? Absolutely. Race, race is a part of everything. Race is, race is a part of everything we do. It's a, fab, it's a part of the fabric of who we are as a country. And I think um, moving forward, I mean, look at, you know, the Beatles, none of them have been charged ever. Rolling Stones, none of them have been charged. Um, we know in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, these people were wild. We know some of the things they did. Not one accusation against any of these um, um, Caucasian artists. We're finding out that now this, that's, that's you know, Bill Cosby, you know, 56 woman. One woman brought him down. One woman. But how is it that we can say this, and I agree with you 100%, but yet the people that point the finger at R. Kelly, they're black. How well, do we address that? Well, we have always been our greatest enemies. I go to the cleaners in, in Atlanta. There's a guy that sits on a stool every single day when I pull up. He say, watch them crabs. Crabs in the bucket. This is what he says to me. I'm not calling those who are making accusations crabs. I'm telling you, that's what he says to me. He said, you got to watch people that are close to you, that look like you. Those are the people that's going to going to bring you down. And you know, for a while I did listen to him. And I started thinking, I'm like, he, he's right. You know, we know what the white man's going to do. We know his intentions are clear. He's going to tell you what he's going to do in your face. You're going to know his intentions. The difference with us and them, we stab you in the back and we laugh in your face. So um, this problem's been going on. We, our, our greatest um, um, weapon against ourselves uh, is probably not sticking together. How do we stick together in a time with R. Kelly? In the R. Kelly era, what can black folks do to prevent or be proactive against some of these accusations wait, and charges? Wait, wait. America, I've said every single time I've stood at a press conference, America is the greatest country in the world. When we get it right, we get it right. But when we get it wrong, we get it wrong. A lot of people didn't agree with O.J. Simpson uh, verdict, but he was found um, guilty on one hand, innocent on the other. Uh, those who, when he was found guilty, they celebrated. When he was found guilty, they did celebrate. When people got what they wanted, they were happy. We always say, whatever the judicial system says, that's what we're going to go with. The verdict of a jury, our peers. And I'm finding out, we don't want to wait to a jury of 12 make a, a decision. We want blood. We want it now. If someone says that you've done something, and all of us are guilty of something, you know, it just had to come out. Me. Do you think that's why so many superstars or other artists are so reluctant because they know that they've had some of the same accusations? I don't know. I've, you know, you know, I've, you know, you know, everybody has issues. You had issues. I've had issues. Uh, you know, not you know what Kelly's accused of, but everybody has something. Any the word says if you say you have no sin, you are a lie, and the truth is not in you. So we all have something. Some of us still have meat on the bones, but. You know, we cover it up very well. You know, we, we just dust, dust it off. You see what I'm saying? If you noticed in the beginning, I asked him about the Gail King interview and he immediately responded and brushed it off. You know, that's a characteristic and a trait of a con man. That is what uh, people do 
when they don't really want to answer the question or face the point. So they're going to answer it, but they're going to <laughs> they're going to try to sweep it under the rug. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, tapes don't lie, and I have a ton of them, and I have a ton of footage on him. So what I'm trying to say is I am trying to break down uh, I'm trying to just break down the whole saga of this and I'm trying to do it in a different way and what has allowed me uh, to be able to do that is again you know I have proof I have footage you know unlike others uh, I'm not just going off of opinion I'm going off of the facts and I depend on those facts with my tapes. Now, let me move away from that and go into something that I addressed on the last podcast. And that was who brought in Jennifer Bonjean. So what I am going to do is I am going to play an interview that I had uh, with the Perryman sisters in regards to R. Kelly. And I'm glad that I didn't play it before because now, you know, this person saying they got this person and this person saying that, you know, I'm going to give you another person who makes the accusations of what they did. Now, this is not to say that they aren't telling the truth, but the, the point for me is, I just want you guys to understand, do you see how many people in this saga have stepped up to say whatever it is that they've said? So my question to you is after listening, who do you believe? Like it's so many people, so many things. And if you break it down, you don't know which way to turn. You understand? Which also brings me, you know, I was going to show, you know, Cassandra and Lisa's interview today because they're making headways and uh, people are starting to buy into the, uh, excuse me, this is my sister. Thing. And I've always stood neutral with that. If R. Kelly has accepted them, he's accepted them. But I think the world is starting to accept them. Not only were they on, you know, Good Morning Britain, America, they uh, they've made it to Hot 97. You know, I'm at home listening and, and I'm like, wow, they really starting to get around. And I guess that's a good thing because they are trying to defend uh, R. Kelly. You know, I don't know if it's a tad bit too late, but what I do believe is with the information that they are providing, uh, it will help you look deeper into the situation. You understand? But let me get away from that because I will show that in another podcast. You know, I, I'm, I'm unfortunately these podcasts now are getting a little deeper and they're exceeding the hour time. But I want to bring you the information so you can have a clearer picture. And I am not trying to sway you either way. But if you have all of the evident evidence present, then you'll understand. So let me go into the interview uh, with them. Take a listen. Jen, you there? Yeah, I'm here. How are we doing today? Good. I'm so glad to be on here. I just recently found out that you had a podcast and um, felt like it was a good time to, to get loud because <laughs> of what's been happening, you know, with Rob. Yeah, it seems, uh, it seems to be a lot. You know what? I want to get into something immediately. Uh, first of all, let's uh, tell the people exactly who you are, what part you played in the R. Kelly uh, saga. Okay, so I'm Jen, my, I go by Jen Perryman Emmerich, and I worked for Robert as an intern and a personal assistant um, from 1999 till 2002. Um, after quitting, I quit working for him because his wife at the time was very, was very difficult, and I just did not see a long future with that. When you so, say difficult, what do you mean? Specify well, she was very. She was not easy to get along with. She um, made it very clear that that we were the help. Um, my sister Lindsay worked for Rob um, from 1999 till 2008, and um, and so with during the time that I worked for them from 1999 to 2002, um, Lindsay and I would rotate. So one of us, we were both personal assistants. One of us would go to the house and help Drea for a couple of days. And the other one would stay at the studio and help Robert. 
for a couple of days, and then we would switch oh, out. Please. Well, Drea, like when when we would stay at the house, Drea wouldn't let us leave. What do you mean she wouldn't let you leave? I mean, even like if um, I was a smoker at the time, okay. and I mean to leave to go to a gas station to get cigarettes, or you know if I wanted to go and get fast food or something. I mean, I just it was not allowed. Right. And that was from her. I I don't know, honestly. I have no idea because finally it it became such a problem that I I actually let Rob know because I was miserable and um, and she was not nice to me. And um, I mean, I spent most of the time with the kids, so I would play with the kids, and that was that was fun, like with Joanne and Jaya. And uh, so finally, I let Rob know, and Rob said, okay, you know, um, thank you for letting me know. From now on, just go through me. You can leave whenever you want. Just make sure, you know, Drea and the kids are okay. And, you know, just do whatever you need to do. Let me ask and you he this. said, just, like, just call me. Let me ask you this. During that time, uh, some of the accusations and allegations that are con- surrounding him are uh, about other women. Did you ever see other women uh, in addition to Drea around the house? No. No, not at all. No. Uh, I mean, it was Rob, I mean, it was very uh, routine, very structured um, as far as Rob's life. So he, when he was at the studio, he was recording music. Right. He was following a diet. He was following a schedule. Right. When he was at home, <laughs> when he was at home, then he was spending time with Drea and the kids. Right. So and so Lindsay and I, you know, when when we were at the house, when both Robert and Drea were there, then we helped with the kids. So that way, Robert would get some quality time together. Okay. Uh, let me fast forward uh, because. I know one of the controversial things that people are going to question and wonder about was his 2008 trial. You guys were around during yeah. that trial, correct? Lin- Lindsay was. Um, Lindsay was actually um, like stalked by the prosecutor. Okay. And she had already quit working for Robert in at um, CRC in Chicago. And the prosecutor was coming to her work. And making her life very difficult. So she was around, um, and and she was subpoenaed to testify against him in that trial. I know, and that's what people are going to remember. Uh, what exactly did she say? The prosecutor? No, your sister. She, well, okay, so Lindsay, um, she felt like she was set up. She was... Every time the prosecutor came to her work, it made me look bad and unprofessional. Because okay. the prosecutor had just had a baby, a newborn baby. And she was coming to Lindsay's work to investigate with the newborn baby that she just had. And and then, um, yeah, obviously, Lindsay was subpoenaed. And then once she got to the actual trial, she was separated from her own personal attorney that she had hired, Lindsay. And... And made to watch the videotape that was the focus of the trial over and over and over until until she got out into the, the courtroom. Oh, so we're talking about the uh, trial with it's alleged that R. Oh, Kelly was having sex with an underage girl and she, he urinated on her. Is that correct? Right, right. And it, and they actually found in that trial that um, even specifically they could not. They could not identify the female in the video ever. It was right. not clear enough, apparently. And then um, the person, the man in the video, had um, had different like moles and and face shapes than Rob. Okay. I mean, it looked similar, but but it was proven not to be him. So that's why he was acquitted. But then, you know, even though he was acquitted from that trial, he he never. You know, the the public never got past that. Right. So, so fast forward to 2014, he's trying to get his career back, and he's with Sony with, with some kind of crappy deal, and he contacts Lindsay. 
And the first thing he said to her was, I need to be around people that love me. And I need you to help me. I want to get my career back. So Lindsay, Lindsay and Rob had been speaking um, pretty regularly, and she was trying to help them to get his career back. So after, I don't know, close to a year, she didn't know what else to do. Um, she was not on social media very often. She had a, you know, Facebook account, but she was, she was not on it very often. And I had kind of made social media my social, you know, life. So I had a little bit more of a following than her. Right. And I had kept in contact with, with people from, from Robert's past. I always have because I made friends with those people. So, so that's when Lindsay got me involved. And then I, uh, and then Rob and I started to talk more. And that's when I started to, the first thing I said is, is, sorry, I have so much to say about this, but the first thing I said was the public is going to want to talk about the, the trial. Right. That's why his career is not going well. But Rob, Rob never wanted to address that. I mean, that's just his personality. He would just shut it down and didn't want to talk about it. He just wanted to move on. So, so I took it upon myself. I was, you know, I thought, well, you know, if, if this were me, you know, and with the public, I would want one of my past employees to to talk about their experience. And I've seen other celebrity um, employees speak out and, and people listened, and it worked. And that's when I started, you know, posting on Instagram, and then I started posting on Facebook, and people started to 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 hear my story right. about my experience working for Rob and then Lindsay's story. And so it kind of spiraled from there. So then, you know, and our, our story never changed. We're not reading from a script or, you know, it is what it is. And so, so then shortly after that, then all of a sudden the surviving R. Kelly came out, right. the series. Right. And I, Rob didn't know about it. Lindsay didn't know about it. And, um, in fact, I, I told them. And Rob said, just ignore it. You know, it's not, it's not a big deal. It's just, you know, he just stays unplugged. And, and, and I just said, okay. And I told Lindsay, I said, Lindsay, you know, one of us needs to watch this. And I'm, you know, I guess I will. And so I watched it. And then I called Rob and I said, Rob, you kind of know what you're going up against. Like this could be a big deal. Right. And because it was lifetime television, he, I mean, he didn't think it would be, and because he knew that the stuff wasn't true. But Wait a minute. You, let me let me let me go back for a minute. This is the first part or the second part you're talking about? Because the you first guys, part. Okay, because you were in the second part, correct? No, we were okay. So I guess there was a second one, and it didn't do very good. No, so you were and in the first one. No, there we were in the third one. The third. There was one. a third one. Okay. So, but. But the producers didn't tell us it was a surviving R. Kelly. They they made it seem like they were doing a series, um, you know, to to go against the surviving R. Kelly. And they even gave it another title and everything. And and I mean, they they know what they're doing. They were, you know, just calling in, checking on us and you know, getting us motivated to speak out on Rob's behalf. And it wasn't until uh, after we filmed that we had found out that it was another surviving R. Kelly. And, and in the contract, I reread the contract and it said that they could change stuff at any time. So are you so, saying you were tricked? Yeah, I mean, we were definitely tricked. Absolutely tricked. And And after it aired... People didn't like us. Yeah, you know, the public didn't like us. And the producers called and said, I'm so sorry. And if, you know, if you need it, I know of a service to where you can get, um, uh, uh, what is it, sponge off the internet or something okay. for safety. I mean, that's all that they could offer us. Excuse me. Whatever's on the internet is there forever. It's not going away. So that's not true. When when these guys approached you, did you ever feel that anything was suspicious? Did you ever think that this was going to be used against him? No. Nope. What Do you mean as far as the series? Yes. Yeah, no. 
No, and that's the thing because, um, you know, we we got so loud on social media and that's what they had claimed, you know, that, that they had found us and they wanted to help, you know. And, and then we had also done an um, interview with um, Tasha Kay and Tasha Kay. She did the same thing, but but she stuck to her word on the interview, and it was a good interview, right. you know. So we really trusted these people, and even when we got there and got into hair and makeup, I mean, they were in the producers were in the room in support of R. Kelly. <laughs> really? So yeah. They, really? So do you think that was a psychological tactic that they used to trick you? Oh, absolutely, because you know, I I didn't feel anything weird until i got into the studio i thought i saw my sister Mm -hmm. so i took my phone and took a picture just you know just to have it and they freaked out they wanted to see my phone i mean they were treating me almost like a criminal and and then i realized that wasn't my sister the room was kind of dark and um and i mean the lady had blonde hair and it it looked just like Lindsay. and the and they and and i looked at them and i said uh that's my phone those are my pictures and I'm not on trial here. This is not, this is weird. Right. And and then they, and then, and as soon as I said that, then they kind of changed their tune. The other producer came up and, and, you know, just kind of sweet talked me. And, and then we did the interview. And it turned out it was surviving R. Kelly. At, at the time of doing the interview, did you see any other, uh, participants in front of you no no it was just Lindsay and me it was, and we had free range to walk around um the production building um they had um uh, uh different dressing rooms they had um even like a area where you can go and get you know snacks stuff to drink and we had free range i, I mean, mean there was and there was nobody else there let me ask you this. After it came out and you seen the damage that it did, did you ever get in contact back with Lifetime or did anyone get back in contact with you? Yeah, the producers. And what the, did they say? I mean, they, they just, they said that they were sorry and pretty much, I mean, that, way, like, that they could just get us, you know, that we could pay a service to get our information taken off the internet. <laughs> that you could pay or they would pay? No, that we could pay. Wow. And, and so we said we weren't worried about it, you know, because we just, I think we kind of trended on Twitter for a little bit. And right. neither one of us were pretty active on Twitter ever. So we just weren't worried about it. So but, do, do you think you were, twi- do you think that you were trending on Twitter because of R. Kelly? Or let me ask you this. This is the question that I really want to ask. And some people might see it as being funny because I think I asked you this before because you took part in my uh, documentary as well. Do you think yes. race had anything to do with it because you were white women? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, we were, well, we were the only white, you know, well, we had, you know, Dylan, uh, Rob's former engineer. He was a white male. Uh, but yeah, we were the only white women. I mean, only white people, really. How do you feel about that? Um, I... <laughs> It wasn't, I don't know. I didn't take that part personally because, um, you know, I was there to stand up for my friend, Robert Kelly. Right. And, you know, this whole thing has been about, you know, standing up for my friend. And right. the, and I did that. So I didn't really look at the race, the race part. Stop, um, stop, but, stop. You had to look at the race. I got to interject with that because you got to realize and understand something. R. Kelly is, a, is an entertainer whose music uh, goes to everybody, but it is a primarily yes. African-American music. And yeah. there is a benefit to having white women in your organization. Now, you have to admit that you know that. Do you agree with that? I mean, I I think... Come on Yeah, now. I mean... I guess I never, I mean, I'll be honest, I've been a little naive to that, but I can see that for sure. Of course. I, you know, I, you know, especially with Rob, you know, we're two, two white women. We're educated. We care about him. Um, we have nothing to lose or gain from this. We're honest. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've been a little naive to that. So I, you- I'm sure Lindsay would say something different, but but I have been a little naive to that. I mean, that's just the way the world is. And at the end of the day, I don't think it's a bad thing, but I think there's a benefit to both uh, the black and white issue because I think sometimes white women can uh, bring about an ease. It can take off uh, 
what is the word I'm looking for? It can take off, take the chip off your shoulder. It can let you, it can allow you to let your guard down because you're not as intimidating or threatening in certain situations. And black people right. are more uh, open to dealing with white women. Uh, that's just the way yeah. it is in America. So do yeah. you believe in all honesty that that might have been one of the reasons that Rob even had you in the camp? He, um, the reason why he had us in the camp, um, first of all, it started with Lindsay. She had, uh, she was going to be an audio engineer. She went to school for that. It was like a little six month program. Okay. And we were from the Chicago suburbs. Well, um, the we're only place Chicago. that we're at in Chicago, huh? where, uh, well, we grew up in Wheaton Oh, okay. and then once we turned 18, then we moved, um, uh, moved up to the North side and then lived in the gold coast for a little while. Okay. Um, but, um, Lindsay was going to be an audio engineer right? and Rob didn't like her being, he saw it, how the male engineers were treating her and he didn't like it. Right. He felt like she was being disrespected. Right. So he offered to take her out of the studio, make her an assistant and pay her more than he ever would have as a audio engineer. Wow. Yeah. That was and great. then, and then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that's Rob. I mean, that's, he's always been that way. I mean, so, um, so that, that's where that came. That's how that came about. And then Lindsay, um, I, I wasn't working at the time. And so Lindsay would always invite me to come up and hang out at the studio while she was working. Cause Rob didn't care. I mean, he, you know, he did, he did not care. So I'd come up there and hang out. And then finally, uh, one day he was, um, you know, just in the studio and he said, you're not working? And I said, no. He said, all right, well, you're hired. Wow. <laughs> and then, and that's how I became an intern. So, okay. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we barely knew who R. Kelly was at the time. We both um, had, in high school, we were into punk rock music and, <laughs> you know, kind of that whole rebellious phase. Right. So, you know, so, and, and I think, I think that's part of the reason why he liked us so much was because we were not starstruck by him. We barely knew who he was and we're there to do a job and we got, we got the job done. Right. Well, I mean, I think that the same thing that can make you like someone could be the same thing that can make you dislike the situation. And what that means is you, you, I think that you was a benefit to him. uh, And I definitely think that in the entertainment industry, because there aren't a lot of, African Americans, at least at that time, in executive positions, the stars and the yeah. artists themselves were black, but the higher ups were usually white. So I think that you were uh, something to put in the mix to kind of like take away that taboo, so to speak. But, I mean, it's helped now. It has, got, and I will say this: I have, a, you know, back then I was naive. I was not as educated as I am now. I now I um, I'm just waiting to take my boards to be a psychiatrist, uh, nurse practitioner. So, you know, with the edu- education that I have today, I do see the difference on, you know, my actions now. Right. And I do feel that, you know, getting a lot on social media it was definitely a benefit to be a white, fem- you know, white female who used to work for R. Kelly. Right. And um, so I do I do see that. And I will be honest. OK. I, I you know what? That, that's what I like. I like honesty. Let me move fast mm-hmm. forward from that and go into now. Uh, Mm -hmm. as far as this trial, we all know what happened with the first trial as far as New York is concerned. Uh, you had some information in regards to one of the lawyers. Why don't you break down, uh, that information and tell us uh, what happened? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, they had me, um, they actually had me booked because everyone said, why didn't you testify? Why didn't you or your sister testify? They had me booked to testify. They had, um, uh, airplane or they had flight booked and um in a hotel say they, who, is, who are they um so that would be nicole um nicole uh oh my gosh the other two guys and i i'm sorry to sound i i was mainly in contact with nicole okay but um but uh the main guy was the african-american attorney Canic. i cannot remember Canic. yes Yes, Canic. Yes. Okay. And then, and so Canic ended up. Um, he ended up being the head of the the head attorney on that trial, and at the very last minute, and when I say last minute, I mean that like the night before, they decided to just focus on the time at the studio, like the last two years at okay. the studio in Chicago. So Who made that decision. Canic. Wow. Okay. 
Yeah. And then also, okay. I mean, yeah, there's just so much to it. I mean, there, yeah. I mean, it could have been done differently because, um, you know, you, they had a lot of, uh, disgruntled employees like Tom Arnold was okay. one of the people that testified against him saying that his paycheck was held by R. Kelly and Tom Arnold, like he used to stalk R. Kelly after he got fired. It wow. would like wait outside his house for like days and beg for his job back. <laughs> and so, so I think that was his moment to kind of get back at Rob, his wow. personal moment. So that, I mean, that's one dynamic. So, I mean, and that that's where they went wrong was they didn't break these people down in the, in the court who they were. And so when you had that accountant who had that diagram mm-hmm. that made it look like a, you know, whatever or organization, right. that's not what it was. It was an accountant who has a license who works for himself. And he, is, that's his little chart that he made for himself. So that way he can refer to payroll and know who is who. So, I mean, you break this stuff down and then they have pictures of people like an organization. Well, if you break that down, you have one guy who runs the social media. You have one guy who's a personal assistant. You have one guy who's the A&R. You have, you know, I mean, and it, it didn't, they didn't break it down. So after the trial, um, I had been in contact with, um, with his uh, former assistant, Diana, who had been his assistant for 10 years. And she really wanted to help Rob because she saw the injustice that was happening and she knew. And um, so after the trial was over, she was allowed to talk to the attorneys and, you know, kind of get a little more involved. Well, she called uh, Bill Cosby's attorney, Jennifer, and spoke to Jennifer and kind of gave her insight of, of what she saw because she had to testify. She was subpoenaed to testify. And Jennifer saw a bunch of holes in the in, in the trial and saw a lot of things that were wrong. So Diana called me and she said, okay, good news. Um, Bill Cosby's attorney, Jennifer, is on board. But I don't know what to do. I don't know, you know, how to make this connection. Well, I was already in contact with Rob's legal team, especially Nicole, and then um, – you know, other people, I mean, pretty much, I mean, everyone from Rob's past pretty much. So I knew who to call and I helped to make that connection to get Jennifer Bonjean on board. Wow. And then, yeah. And then, so now Jennifer is, I mean, she's really doing a phenomenal job, but, but, you know, it's great, you know, in the legal system, right. But we, you know, we're still in the court of public opinion and something that people have not done, even his supporters, his fans, they have not separated the brand R Kelly to the person, Robert Sylvester Kelly. Right. They're still looking at, at the artist and the person as the same. And that's, that's not the case. Right. And I really, I really think that we need to start focusing on, on separating that. Well, let's start right now. Uh, Tell us the difference between Mm -hmm. the artist and the man. In your opinion. Okay, exactly. Okay, so the artist R. Kelly is is a brand, okay? okay. So every celebrity, and I've worked for other celebrities in my past, um, every celebrity is basically a corporation. Right. Okay? So you have the, the artist. Right. Their job is to perform, to record the music, and to send it to the record label. Right. And then with that comes a whole corporation of people. You got the A&R who's listening to the music to you know to make sure it's good pretty much and then you know looking for hits whatever and then you have i mean it's just a whole corporation right and 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 you know the artist has a contract that that he has to um you know uh work under and then with that then um then you also have the guy who performs on stage who tours well then you have the man robert sylvester kelly Okay, so the man's Robert Sylvester Kelly, he's he still goes to work every day to the studio to do his job, you know, and and to make music. But then he also, you know, he has a personal life. He has a family. He has children. You know, he goes out and he plays basketball with he has friends, male adult friends that right. that he has been playing basketball with for years. Right. Um, you know, and then his business is at the recording studio and with his business, because he's famous, he cannot go out and run errands and get his food. 
he cannot go shopping without getting, you know, bombarded. So that's where personal assistants come in. Right. And he had multiple personal assistants for multiple things. I mean, you had food, you know, a special diet to follow. Um, uh, I mean, God, I mean, so much. Right. So, so, so much. So, so when, I mean, I don't know if you really answered the question between the man and the music. Uh, but mm-hmm. I understand where you were going with that. Let me ask you. Yeah, this. I'm sorry. I have like I have a son who's autistic, and I'm kind of watching him. No, that's fine. Trying to keep an eye on him while I'm doing this interview. But I, I understand. You know, I, I think you told me that when I seen you. Uh, what didn't I come to Arizona or did I? I um, Arkansas. Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember yeah. you. You were telling yes. me that then. Uh, yes. I'm going to ask you something that I asked you before, uh, and I want okay. you to think about it. No, before I ask you that, because I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you an advance warning. I'm going to ask you if you think he's guilty. But before I ask you if you think he's guilty, you said that you had uh, interactions with his legal team, such as Kanik and Nicole. In your opinion now, looking back at it, do you think that there was anything done wrong by that legal team? And especially, I'm asking not about Kanik, although I don't like the way he handled it, but I don't know him. I'm asking indirect. I'm asking directly about Nicole. Oh, with Nicole, Nicole. Um, I think Nicole, well, Nicole did a great job. Nicole did amazing um, with the trial. I mean, she really put her all into it. Okay. She truly, truly did. But her hands were tied. I mean, she was really kind of put onto the you know back burner because she was initially hired to represent Azriel and um, Joycelyn. Right. Exactly. So, so that's why she couldn't be as involved it, as Rob needed her to be. But she, she listened to Lindsay and I. She was in contact, constant contact with all of us, okay. and she knew. I mean, she was frustrated with how things went. I mean, she was very frustrated. Well, why but she, she be, thought through. Why, why would she be frustrated? Why do you think she was frustrated? She was frustrated because of the angle that they were going. I mean, you know why. Why focus on the studio? Why focus? I mean, that's not what he's on trial for. He's on trial for false allegations. Right. So why don't we? Why don't we look at these allegations and and you know break that down, and, and look into the dynamic of that. So you're you saying know? so you're saying that Nicole didn't have as much power as Canik to R. Kelly? No, she did not. No. Wow, this is the yep. first time. Wow. She did not. She did everything that she could and everything that we would tell her or anyone would tell her, she would bring it to the table and even tell Rob. I said, tell Rob, you know, he's got to stand up. He's got to tell her. I mean, it was very hard. It was very frustrating. So Very, very frustrating for her, too. I mean, she did everything that she could. I mean, she really... So she how, helped how, as much as she could. How do you feel when you hear people now blame her for the trial? And I'm going to be totally honest. I'm one of those people. I disagree 100 percent with what you're saying. I respect what you're saying, but I think she's shit. That's my personal opinion. It's not going to change. And the reason why I say that is because I, I mean, I say that. I, you, here's why I say that. Then I want you to respond. I say that because Nicole was a part of a coup to uplift, uh, get rid of Greenberg to bring in who she wanted to and handle the case the way she wanted to. And in addition to that, I don't know if you heard, but there were allegations of her actually having an affair with Kelly. So I find it hard to believe that she did not have the power to go to Kelly over Kenny. That's my personal opinion. You can- well, she she got involved after he was arrested. So I don't know about the affair part, but I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I have not heard that, but uh, but I will say this. I will say this. All in all, to this day, this poor man is still in jail. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I but, mean, and, but, and think about it. He had to sit in front of that trial and watch these people that he loved talk so badly about uh, against him and say things that were false. I mean, it, it, the trauma that he has been through is just heartbreaking. Heartbreaking to even think about. But thank God he is a strong man, you know, and and he's very spiritual. And I guarantee you he is hanging on to God's word every single day, you know, and and hopefully Jennifer Bonjean will be the key to this trial. But then, you know, we still have to battle the public and help him get his career back because R&B music, I mean, that 
he's the R in R and B. <laughs> oh, there's, there's no doubt. So now let me ask you the second part of the question I asked you five minutes ago. Do you believe he's guilty or innocent? I believe he's innocent. Okay. Well, I know he's innocent. Okay. Would you like to That's elaborate? That's why I, I advocate for him so much and, you know, and I hurt for him. You know, I, I know that he has a mental deficit and there's no way that he could run, you know, any kind of mafia. I mean, I he has a heart that. of gold. I don't believe he that has, at all. I don't no, believe that at all. There's no way. He doesn't care that much. He's not controlling. He's not weird like that. He's, I mean... I've come across other celebrities that are that are weird and he is he this guy has been true i mean true heart and and that's also why i continue to fight for him right so do you have any plans of uh, appearing in the next trial do you think they're going to subpoena you to testify? i don't know i've been reaching out to jennifer um on social media and just saying use me you know i'm doing the same thing that i did with the last attorneys and you know and if she wants to use me she will and, and i'm available but you know, I, I don't know. What and, and, oh, it, oh, and then with Rob, um, his they made it to where his visitation, he only gets one hour a month wow. um, for visitation. And that includes attorney time. So he has to literally either pick visiting with his attorney or visiting a friend. <laughs> wow. Why do you think they did and, that? I don't know. Honestly, I have no idea. I, I mean, that's literally all I know. And then I know that they shut down for COVID outbreaks and then there was no visitation for a while. But yeah. that's literally all I know. Yeah, and that, I, I, I mean, I'm not sure about the hour visits because you you, you have to have uh, legal visits and that can't uh, go into. Well, Jennifer Bonjean actually spoke out about that because it was such a problem. Right. She did. She did an interview. Um so I, I I don't know what's happening today, you know, but but that's what had been going on. So in all hope, in all hopefulness, uh, you will be testifying if you're called. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so would Lindsay. If there was one thing that you can change about this entire scenario, what would it be and why? OK, so when I would have had. um <laughs> Well, there's a lot that I would have done. I would have um, gone onto the internet. I would have searched the relation that that these women have with with each other, and I would have um, spoken about their allegation. I would have broken it down. I would have brought up, um, you know, evidence that was online that I found when the first surviving R. Kelly came out. I would have looked at the jury, you know, and because there were some jurors that watched the surviving R. Kelly series. Right. Um, there's so much that could have gone different. I mean, it, but Jennifer Bonjean, she's amazing. And I, I really, I, you know, I, I, so far she's doing amazing. And I think she's got a true talent and a knack for this. And I think she's going to be a big key factor here. Of all the people that testified on him, who do you think testified and did the most damaging? Well, I mean, really, the, you know, the, it was amazing because the only one that I really paid attention to was Azriel because it was so ridiculous. Why, and I just thought for sure. That? Why do you say that? Well, because I mean, she kept contra you know, contradicting herself in in changing her story and it was just ridiculous. And I thought for sure that they were gonna throw that out. And they did not. So that's something that Jennifer Bonjean has actually brought to light. Um she's able to um uh uh, I guess she's, uh, from what I hear within the camp, um, she's able to bring text messages yeah. to light that yeah. were between Rob and Azrael's mom, et cetera. So there, there's a lot, I mean, so, so much. And Jennifer Bonjean is on it. I mean, she's making it happen. And that that's all that I know for now. Do you think as far as, as that, that you know, I'm in contact with, um, I mean, I just spoke to Wayne Williams the other day who yeah. discovered Rob. Yeah. That's my um, man. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and, and he, everyone asked, well, why hasn't he done interviews? Well, because he saw what happened to us and, and he doesn't trust anybody. Yeah. You know, and that's scary. Lindsay and I are in the medical field. We don't have anything to lose. We're not in the music industry. Right. Um, but all these other people are, and they have careers, you know, and families to support. So he actually interviewed with me. He, he interviewed with me, and, and we spoke oh, about good. some things that that happened a while ago. Wayne is a good dude, and Wayne definitely yeah. had the best interest of R. Kelly. I think the problem with Wayne is I don't know if he'll be able to handle questions that grill him. 
like some people get discombobulated when you come at them from left to right. And I know. Kinda, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it, it doesn't mean that they're lying. It just means that it's just coming so fast that they can't handle it. And I think that that's kind of Wayne's situation. Uh, well, that was a lot of the situation that for the people that testified, um, you know, for Rob's team. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, that was kind of the issue. Yeah. You know, it, it's so many chapters. There's so many things to be uh, unpeeled and the layers are so deep. Uh, let me ask you this. How do you feel about all of the things that are happening in social media right now with this man's name? When you when you read or you hear or you see things, what goes through your mind? Um, okay, so the biggest thing that, that I see, and I'm glad that you asked that, is, um, you know, you have you finally have all these R. Kelly fans right. that are out there that are supporting him, showing their support. And then you have other R. Kelly fans that, that attack the other R. Kelly fans, and they end <laughs> up fighting each other. Yeah. And, and I, I just wish that that would stop. Yeah. Like, you know, stop attacking, because, you know, I could speak out about some of these R. Kelly supporters and say my personal opinion, but I don't, right. because it's not about me. And they're in, you know, at the end of the day, they're supporting R. Kelly. Right. Period. Right. And and that's the one thing, you know, let's focus on loving each other and not breaking each other down and beating each other up, especially on social media. Right. That's kind of where I stand with that. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of internal uh, big U's and little eyes or however you want to say it that goes amongst people. But I guess that's also what comes with the game. That's what comes with entertainment. And I guess that's what makes it entertaining. Uh, right. And I'm sure that you've, <laughs> you've gone through that because I know they were hot on your ass at one time. You and your sister. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh uh, my gosh. Anytime we brought up anything that we knew, like, you know, um, you know, with anyone that, that and I won't say any names because I don't want to cause a big stir. Man, but I don't give yeah. a shit. You can say whatever you want. This is my show. <laughs> okay, so, they can't nobody tell okay, you what to do. So I okay, so I will be honest, um, and people are gonna hate this. So what? but um okay, so I've been in contact with all these people with you know, with Rob's team right. that, that were from the past that, that were with him even in the 90s. And they all asked me the same thing. And that question is, who is this Sharon Winbush? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, all of them. Even, yeah, I mean, all of them. I really? mean, in, in, yeah, and these are like, um, I mean, these are people that, you know, like, that are involved in the trial and yeah, nobody knows who she is, but, but I don't want to knock that because she's supporting <laughs> Rob. Why do you think then, they, well, wait a minute now, let me just, in defense of Sharon, cause I know Sharon. I mean, you know, we have okay. a phone relationship, <laughs> I, I, you know, no, I, you know what, let, let me just say this before I say that I have been able to befriend quite a few people in the camp, uh, both mm -hmm. who are pro and con, uh, and some people mm -hmm. I, I get slack for, you know, even befriending Azriel. But I think in order to have any kind of a story, you have to have a balance. So you have to have the pros and the cons. So what I, sure. the reason why I'm saying that is because with Sharon, uh, I don't know the relationship that she had with R. Kelly because I wasn't there. I can only go by what she says. But I think she's sincere in what she says. She may go about it her way. But nevertheless, yeah. like you say, she is an, R an avid R. Kelly supporter. So now, yeah, an advocate. So I mean, but th but the re the question I'm trying to get in slide to you now is, if everyone is asking who the hell is Sharon, why do you think they ask that question? Do you think they ask that question because she's uh, accurate in her information, or they think she's crazy? No, they, no, no, no. I mean, it's just on that. No, um, no, they just straight up have no idea who she is. One, one was was you know with rob for many years he doesn't want me to mention his name but um you know he worked for rob in the 90s all the way up and i mean for a very very long time right and even he said who's the sharon and the only thing i that Lindsay and i can come up with is that there was a nanny named sharon but she was very overweight and she was a nanny and she um worked at the george street house okay and but but and i i mean that's the only thing that any of us can think of but well from what i, I understand mean, i may be wrong and i'm sure sharon is going to hear this i may be wrong but i think I, know. I think sharon cooked the food she was like a nutritionist that's what she said but but i mean nobody i mean i I mean, if that's what she says, I, who cares? I mean, she's supporting Rob, and at the end of the day, that's all that matters. But, the but, but that's the same question that all these people, I mean, there are people that are in, involved in the trial, like in with Rob, and 
you know, that's the one question that they all have asked me that they have in common. <laughs> I mean, that it, one question. It, what that would translate to me is that they're listening to her and she may know something that they don't or, you know, because I think I that if she was just crazy. And she well, just yeah, I mean, they know who she is, right? No, right. yeah, because it's not like I'm bringing her up. Yeah, I mean, they, yeah, that's true. That's so a very good point. That's she, interesting. She has to have <laughs> something that is catching their attention. Uh, yeah, you know, but Sharon is Sharon. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not gonna throw Sharon under the bus. I'm not throwing Azriel under the bus. I'm not throwing anybody under the bus because they all serve their purpose. And at the end of the yeah. day, for me, being in media, I am supposed to be non-biased. So if I right. start, you know, shooting shots at different people for different reasons, then I'm no longer non-biased, and I don't think that what I say would make a difference. So as far as that's concerned, but hey, listen. I appreciate you. I appreciate you taking your time to talk to me. Absolutely. Uh, if you ever want to get back in contact with me, you want to get something out, you know how to get in contact with me and, and, and let's let it happen. Hey, and I also thank you. I want to I thank you and I appreciate you being in my documentary. Uh, yes. You know what I want to do? I, I, I need I need some help. You know what? And the reason why I need some help is because there are all kinds of things that were said as far as how I handled my business in the documentary. So now I want to ask you a question. Did I do okay. anything remotely close to disrespectful or sexual towards you and your sister? And how did I treat oh, you? Oh, not at all. No way. I mean, it was like, I mean, no, no way. Yeah. Not I, even close. I just want to be. I mean, not even close. You were um, a true gentleman, very respectful. I mean, I very professional. I I mean, you were amazing. We felt so comfortable. We felt like we'd known you for years. Exactly. I mean, and it that, was yeah. That's how it is with especially with the women. I've never done anything out of order, <laughs> and we were just cool. We like you guys were at the bar. Uh, mm -hmm. I, we went up to the room, which was a suite. You actually waited mm -hmm. because I had to put all my lights and shit on, and you guys were patient, mm -hmm. like. So I, I'm just saying that in defense to when you hear people say things. And then I guess the hundred thousand dollar question as well is what does Shabazz look like? Everybody wants me to show my face. And my thing is you'll see my face if need be. If you don't need to see me, right. you're not seeing me. But you guys have yeah. seen me, correct? Yeah, yes, we have absolutely <laughs> seen you. So. And you're very uh, yeah, I mean you're very professional, very clean, very yeah, I mean Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and, and anyone in the industry would know, you know, how professional this is. Um, I mean, you even came with the B-roll, you know, yeah. and with your equipment and, you know, with, with the green screen and everything. And, um, you know, very professional, yeah. very, very professional. And you set it up all up on your own. I did. I, I mean, moved, that's smart. I moved by myself. And the reason why I moved by myself mm -hmm. is because, well, not all the time, but in certain sense, instances, I do move along because I don't need all of the extra baggage because you know what? Extra people is extra baggage and they can cause you more problems than you need. And I don't yes. need no problem. So I move alone. But hey, listen, right. thank you for being my defense lawyer for the last 60 seconds. Uh, and Absolutely. I, I appreciate you uh, defending Rob. Uh, I think yeah. it's, I think it's bigger than Rob. To be totally honest, I'm doing what I do because Rob is a reflection of black people. I'm a black mm -hmm. man. And if we allow that to happen mm -hmm. to one black man, you might as well allow it to happen to two. And that is something exactly that right. I cannot go mm -hmm. for. And it doesn't matter your color or whatever. If you like R&B or you like whatever it is, that's what you like. My only provision with that is everybody has a place to play. And as long as you stay in your place, liking what you like, I don't have a problem with it. And I can respectfully say that I think that you guys have stayed in your place and not meaning in a racial type of a way, standing in your place by doing what you were supposed to do and not getting involved with the bullshit. Right. And that's yeah. all that's important. So, hey, listen, yep. I am going to let you go because we I don't like to have these uh, podcast longer than the hour because I think that is now the recording that you heard <clears throat> excuse me was a, a recording that was done uh, maybe two months ago for whatever reason it always hid uh, in my files and I thought I lost it I didn't lose it whatever whatever and I'm glad that I still have it uh, I have so much stuff like that it's just not funny but in any event you guys have heard what you've heard. You've seen what you've seen. So now it's up to you to make your own conclusion. Uh, I hope that I've uh, enlightened you for the day. I definitely hope that I uh, put a smile on your face. 
and because of the time, I don't want to make this long and drawn out. So with that being said, I'll simply say, have a nice day. <laughs>